Sparks, uh, who is one of the top poker players in the world. And I wanted to have a conversation about risk management. <laughs> Given the uh, current situation in the public markets, uh, especially, but even um, with a number of assets, uh, we are going into very uncharted, risky uh, time period in the financial markets. And so uh, what better than to talk to a poker player about how to make decisions with uh, incomplete information? So thanks so much for coming to do this. Thank you so much, Pomp. It's a pleasure to be here. I wish it was under uh, more pleasant circumstances, but I'm sure it'll make for an interesting conversation. For sure. Um, let's just jump right into your background. Uh, people, I think, are fascinated by poker, especially uh, kind of the highest, most elite levels. Um, how do you go from the day you're born to one of the best poker players in the world? <laughs> I'll give uh, I'll give a cliff note, and we can uh, you know dive into specific examples um, as you know drop some breadcrumbs in there. So I've always been into games, uh, played card games growing up. I was uh, one of the world's best uh, gin players, um, which is a one-on-one -on -one version of Rummy. Um, I was really proficient at a game called Microsoft Ants, which was an early real-time strategy game. Uh, at one point, I was uh, ranked number one in the world in that game in a very small player pool. And this kind of seeded the ground for me to combine the two of those where gin is essentially a form of heads up poker where you are analyzing your opponent you are trying to give him an impression that you have a certain hand right you're telling a story but really you have something else you, you haven't believed that you need him to discard these cards but actually you need the other cards and the real-time strategy aspect where you're in a very dynamic situation. The environment is changing very quickly. You have to, you have opponents who are the you know noise in the system that you can't account for that you have to quickly adjust. You have this metagame element. So you're trying to accomplish this goal, acquire resources, but at the same time you have to take the system into account. You have to take outside forces into account, your opponents. Um, so I already started, you know, when the moneymaker bubble hit, this was you know, you have 2001 World Poker Tour starts broadcasting um, whole cards. So poker becomes a spectator sport. Um, then you have Chris Moneymaker winning the World Series of Poker on a, uh, I believe, a $200 satellite. Um, he was a, just an accountant, 2000, 2003. All of a sudden, poker is on every station in ESPN. Um, this is when I started university at Ohio State. Um, so I, I was playing uh, free roll tournaments at this time on, you know, my parents' dial-up internet single line where I'd play for 12 hours trying to win, you know, a $5,000, you know, free roll tournament with, you know, no, no entry because it's a free roll, but with, you know, tens of thousands of people. So I had some practice. Um, and then when I entered into university, poker was what everyone did. If you were a man in college at this time, you were playing poker. That's how we socialize. That's how we hang out. That's how we got social status. And I quickly realized that I had a knack for the game, that my previous experiences gave me quite an advantage. And so a few of my friends who I thought weren't very good players introduced me to online play and it immediately became an extra source of income for me to pay off my tuition. Um, I'll fast forward, um, you know, senior year, I'm already winning at the, the mid-stakes levels. Um, I had progressed from, I first started playing, you know, large tournaments, you know, buy-ins from ten to $1,000, to now is playing cash games, mid-stakes online. So buy-ins ranging from 400 to to $1,000, playing 24 tables simultaneously, up to 30, but it turns out 24 tables was the sweet spot. Um, and... I was ready to enter the workforce. So, you know, Midwest guy, um, I assumed that I was going to go into the corporate world, and my dream from a young age was to make television commercials. Uh, the thread that ties a lot of my work together is I'm really driven to understand how we make decisions. And this aspect of how do brands tell a story that alters behavior, right? Every commercial is essentially selling some infinite value. You know, you have unlimited integrity, you, you have family, you have you know, friendship, um, you have risk-taking, adventure. Um, all these things are sold and then attached to a brand. And so we, we consume in order to affirm our infinite values. And that, I found that infinitely fascinating. How could I learn the mechanisms of production to accomplish that myself? Um, so I, uh, I was in a reality show in my senior year called Quad Squads that ended up 
um, making an introduction to the head of Team Detroit, which does the uh, advertising for Ford. Um, so after having the opportunity to work on a Super Bowl campaign for Nationwide my junior year, um, I figured why not go to the largest television advertiser in the world, which was Ford at the time. And so I'm going to try to sell cars. And so if you're doing your math, right, I started uh, college 2004 and now we're getting to 2008. You know, seems like sometimes a decade happens in a week. And this was another one of those times where uh, the week before I was supposed to start my full time job at Ford, the auto industry collapses, uh, total bailout. Ford goes on a hiring freeze, and I'm in hiring purgatory, essentially hired, but not hired, not on the payroll, but not able to seek other employment. And um, this was, on one hand, a very, you know, bad luck. I had I'd kind of put all my eggs in this basket. I'd actually moved up to Detroit, Michigan, um, where I knew, knew, knew no one, you know, ready to take on this position. But obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, this was a massive blessing in disguise. I mean, first, I escaped the corporate world, but I moved from having, you know, 10 to 20 hours a week to play poker while I was in college because I was pretty, you know, involved, full course load, you know, multiple student organizations, you know, essentially I'm foregoing sleep if I want to play, um, to now I have a, a completely open schedule with no responsibilities, total freedom, and I say, what does it look like to treat poker as a job? And you know, it becomes an 80-hour-a-week thing, and within a couple years, um, I'm ranked in the top 20 online players in the world. So there's a whole bunch in there. The part to me that's wild is when I think of online poker, I think about people sitting down and playing at one table. But the best players in the world, you're playing 24 tables at a time. How the hell do you do that? Intuition. Um, it's a fuzzy word. My definition of intuition is internalized experience. And so when you have put in millions of poker hands like I have, so, you know, by the time I was 22, I had played more hands of poker than people who had been playing professionally their entire lives. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen it all and my pattern recognition is extremely good. I'm very, very sensitive to nuance, to the difference between signal and noise. Um, there's the classic study that, um, you know, we're thinking in terms of information, you know, bits of information where we are taking in millions of bits of information, but we are have a hard cap of our working memory and that we're only conscious of a couple dozen of those million bits. Mm -hmm. And so the power of this internalized experience is that I know exactly what information I need in order to make decisions. So while to a untrained eye this looks like minority report, how do you heck do you keep track of all this stuff? The truth is the vast majority of it is just noise to be ignored and I'm only paying to the attention to the few signals that really matter. Got it. And so let's walk through poker in general, because really I want to have a conversation about um, your experience as a poker player with those millions of hands of poker. Um, you constantly have to make decisions. Uh, you have to manage risk. And a lot of times you're doing it with uh, a portion of information, right? The things that are known to you, but you also have a number of things that are unknown to you, right? Kind of data points that uh, you know are out there, but you don't have. Um, that's very similar to financial investing right, is uh, especially in a time like right now where there's high levels of volatility, uh, people are having to make decisions and kind of manage risk and, and do it all under the guise of, I have some uh, data points that I know, and then I know there's other data points that are out there, but I don't know whether they're future data points, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of parallels there. Let's start with poker first. How do you think about the decision making in, you know, on a per hand basis or a per game basis and kind of walk us through that framework that you use um, for that risk management and decision making? Sure, I'll verbalize it the best that I can. Um, so first coming in, you always want to have a plan, right? Classic, no plan survives contact with the enemy, but still the the exercise of planning is incredibly useful because it primes you for what new information is going to be important. So when am I going to have to throw this plan away? How am I going to update it? And so I'm coming into a session when I sit down to play with a game plan. And so part of that is what types of games am I looking to play? 
uh, who am I targeting at these tables, right? I am sitting down at these tables specifically to play with certain players who I believe will be profitable to play with. And so what is my plan in order to get into hands with these players? My assumption is that the more hands that I play with these players, my small edge will be compounded. Um, and then within those, trying to anticipate how could this go wrong? What are the obstacles? So who else is at the table? Um, really key is stack sizes. So the game is very dynamic based upon how deep you are playing, how much money is at stake, as well as your position. So money tends to flow clockwise at a table. So being in position where you're acting after someone in a hand versus out of position where you're acting afterwards makes a huge difference in terms of your expected value on the hand. And so I might sit down at a game and I might not sit down at that same game if my position is going to be different. Um, and so I'm trying to anticipate these things in advance where I really like the Bayesian framework here, or another framework that's very useful is the OODA loop. So observe, orient, decide, act, and particularly the orient part of the loop where I am paying attention to which variables are most important for my decisions at the table and being very sensitive to when those variables are changing, or essentially trying to predict the future. So part of that is even though someone is I can't see them, right? I'm not sitting across to them like you and I are. There is a person on the other side of the screen. Mm -hmm. And this online interface of a poker game is just an intermediary or a translator for their state of mind. And that, that's very noisy. I have to think about chat. I have to think about click speed. I think about bet size, that they bet 60, 666 versus 665. All of these things can matter in the right circumstance, but it's all compared to a baseline. So you look at classic studies, say, like Paul Ekman's work as far as lie detection, and they always talk about a baseline where no behavior matters except for compared to a baseline. So how does this player play on average? Mm -hmm. And so a large part of the player pool, let's say I'm sitting down at a, at a game of six players, including myself, it's going to be generally four other professional players and then one recreational player. The four professional players I tend to play with every single day. You have a player pool of maybe 100 people in the world and you play with them every day, so you get to know their game very, very well. And because they're professionals, they tend to be very consistent. But consistency can also be a downside in that they become predictable. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm base, I have a baseline of these players at the table and I'm sensitive to conditions that might cause them to deviate from that baseline. Line. Most of my attention is directed towards the recreational player, where I'm quickly trying to thin slice them into an archetype. How is this player going to play on average? I mean, the four classic archetypes, you know, if you have a two by two grid, it's tight, loose, passive aggressive. So my strategy against an opponent who's loose aggressive, playing too many hands and playing them very aggressively is going to be very different from someone who's playing too many hands and playing them passively. Mm -hmm. um, and so once I have them into a bucket, I can predict their decision making pretty accurately and I don't need to be as nuanced. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a kind of a sample as far as sitting down with the game plan. At the same time uh, that I'm trying to track the state of mind of everyone else's table, at, at the table, I'm trying to track my own state of mind because this is dynamic throughout. You know, if I'm giving myself a grade A through F on, you know, what's my decision-making ability, trying to correlate that at any given time so that if I start to slip, I have a stop loss, I cut off the damage at the source. Um, so sometimes I sit down planning to play for a long time, and I play for 15 minutes and I cut it off, I stop. Other times I'm like, oh, I'm just going to sit down and check it out and end up sitting down for 16 hours straight. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to predict in advance and it's part of the success is just showing up and being ready for what comes. Um, and it, it tends to fall on a power law distribution where if you take out, say, my 10 biggest days of the year, I'm barely profitable. But if I hadn't, you know, if I couldn't have predicted those 10 days in advance. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what you are describing sounds like financial markets, right? Um, one of the things that uh, struck me in, in the description you just gave, though, is there's some very specific things that you can do that are in your control before you even play the game, 
right? And, and I'll break them into two buckets. So one is uh, the whole idea of having a plan and going through that process can be valuable. Uh, and then the second is um, kind of how you position yourself, right? So whether this is who you're targeting, what seat you sit at, et cetera. Um, how much of that is uh, just repetition, right? Meaning that you've done it so many times that it's second nature versus you're actually sitting down and like, writing out a plan and saying, I want to sit in the third seat and, and all of that, you know, how kind of sophisticated and uh, intentional versus just you've done it so many times that now it's just intuition. I think that any paradigm can be subverted once it's been internalized. So in the beginning, I was extremely diligent about writing out this plan in advance, having a ritual that I'd follow before sitting down, um, kind of a checklist. The, just to ensure that I've, I've fully prepared. Um, now, as I've internalized that, um, I am less strict about the process and it's more of a mental exercise. Um, What's but, on a checklist? So checklist, um, various things as far as, you know, my mental state. So have I done my habits today? Um, particularly, have I journaled to empty my brain? Have I meditated to center myself? Have I stretched? I might be sitting down in this chair for 16 hours. Am I prepared for that? Do I have enough water? Have I eaten? Just like basic, you know, am I, am I ready for a big day if this becomes a big day? Um, you know, taking assessments of my mental state, I'll um, you know ping my network as far as you know how do the how are the games looking what to expect is there anyone I should be keeping an eye out for um, you know playing on one site versus another trying to get an idea for the landscape um, and then you know I was having music picked out in advance so having a playlist that I'll roll through that kind of keeps me in flow these sort of just basic checklists like am I ready to play and it's kind of going through this ritual almost increases my discipline just by going through it because I'm primed, hey, this is important. Um, and then, you know, I'm scanning the tables and while, you know, I'm trying to get on them because, you know, sometimes I have to wait in order to get on the game. Some games they have a waiting list, so people need to leave. Other times it's the first one to click, kind of a high frequency trading situation. Um, you know, there's, there's some lag time where I'm not immediately playing 24 games. I ramp up to it. Mm -hmm. And, and it feels to me like a lot of what you just described is uh, very focused on the your emotional and mental state, right? So uh, understanding that um, it's not so much the exact decisions you make as much as it is putting yourself in the position to make good decisions, right? Um, once you get into the game, so you've figured out what tables you want to sit at, you're in the right seat, you start to play, you've identified who the professional players are, who's not, etc. How do you think through the actual evaluation of the cards you have, the cards that are on the table, the cards that other people may have, but you don't know what they have, um, and kind of that framework of you have some of the information, but you don't have all of it, and a lot of it's out of your control at that point? Cool. Well, I'm, I'm going to try to bring it a little bit out of the abstract at the risk of you know, losing a few of you guys who have less experience in poker, but, you know, pay attention to the principles rather than the specific terms. So I'll walk you through a hypothetical hand and the things that I'm thinking about. So um, let's say that I decide to enter a hand, that the hand reach, reaches, you know, exceeds my minimum threshold for entering the pot, which is going to go up exponentially with my position. So from the earliest positions, playing very a very tight range of hands, and as I get to the later positions, and especially the button and the small blind, if there has not been any action, my, my hand range opens up quite a bit. So sometimes, in some cases, five times as many hands, so that position is that important. Um, and if someone else has entered into the pot before me, obviously trying to think about what their range is. Um, playing online for a regular player, I sometimes some cases I'll have enough hands to know an exact range that they have. And so I'm, I'm limiting the potential universe of all of the hands they could have, you know, we call this the potential range, down to a smaller set of that range so that they can only have one of these hands because they have done this. Um, and then as the hand progresses, so we see a flop, there is a, let's say, let's to, to simplify, I'll use an, a specific example. So let's say that um, someone opens from early position and so they have a tight range of hands and I'm in the big blind and so I have a little bit of money in there and I'm closing out the action, nothing else can happen after me. So I'm actually calling a wider range of hands. And, and the range that I'm calling is pretty well known to, let's say we're playing against a good player, so a little, little bit more predictable. 
and there comes out a flop. And so I'm thinking about how does this flop interact with their range versus my range. If it interacts with my range on average better than their range, I'm going to be aggressive regardless of my actual holdings. My holdings don't really matter all that much. If I win, like it's, it only matters to the fact that my bluffs don't need to work as often. I have additional equity in the hand. I'm entitled to more of the pot. It's kind of a fail safe if things go wrong, but I'm not playing my hand as much as the hands that I could be having. And so if it comes out with a flop that's you know, better for my opponent's range, something with high cards, you know, the worst would be something like ace, king, queen. Um, you know, I'm generally going to be playing, you know, very tight passive, folding a lot because I can get myself in a lot of trouble. The most expensive hands are second best hands and playing passively because as we say, my range is capped. I cannot have the best hands and he has all the best hands. Now, if the, the flop is something that's much better for my range of hands, say something like, you know, four, five, six with two spades, well, he has very few fours, fives, and sixes in his range because of the position that he opened, and I have a lot more. And so he's going to have to play much more passively, and I'm going to be able to play much more aggressively. And then that that continues as you go to the turn, where you have one more card, and then to the which changes the the placement sometimes a great deal. So a card on four, five, six boards, something like a jack is a blank, doesn't change much, but a seven, or especially a seven of spades, makes this board maximally wet. It changes things a great deal. And so that's where you make very, very large adjustments based upon new information. And then you have the river where all the information is known except for the, the opponent's hood cards, and essentially is like, is this opponent bluffing enough in order to call? Or how much, how much do I need to bluff? We call this a minimum bluff frequency in order to remain balanced. Um, and so I look at where my hand ranks in the range of all hands. So if I have one of the worst hands I could possibly have, I'm always bluffing. If I have one of the middle hands where sometimes I beat, beat him, I don't need to bluff. If I have the top range of my hands, one of my best hands, I'm always betting. Um, and so you can see how ha this, you have these compounding probabilities where as new information is introduced to the game, you know, seeing what positions where they raised um, the action and then the cards, how they, with this new information they react, I can continually limit down the range of possible hands they have, you know, combinatorily weighted to the, to, I say, oh, well, given that he has he, these hands, I need to be bluffing this percentage of the time, that type of thing. Got it. And, and so at what point do you go from probabilities to certainty? Or do you never actually get to certainty uh, it, it, unless it's the cards that you hold and you know with 100% certainty you have the best hand? Certainty is a very dangerous thing. Um, there's, there's no case in that you're certain. And even if you are certain what the best move is, there is the additional variable of bet sizing where um, you know, it's, you, you, there's, there's situations where you can be very elastic to bet sizing or versus being very inelastic. So certainty would be is I am folding no matter what they mm -hmm. bet. Um, and elastic is, well, if they bet a lot, I might have to fold. If they bet really small, I might have to call because you're getting a better price. Mm -hmm. For example, if someone bets half the pot, I only need to be right 33% of the time in order to make a profitable call. And this is something that's very, very difficult for non-expert players to internalize is you can be making these decisions where we're so we're so weighted like you know it is or it isn't like you know well I called and he had it it was a bad call there are calls that I make where I know I'm going to be wrong 90% of the time but I still have to call it and it's very difficult to know the difference between you know I'm wrong you know he has it 10% of the time and 20% of the time and to be to get that feedback that you were wrong but still believe in what your system's like hey that was the right call because i was getting a very good price mm -hmm. um, that's a very very important skill and and that go, kind of goes into the in, but over time i've built a very good fingertip feel for them um, and and so this idea of price is really interesting right i've never really heard somebody describe especially poker that way where um, you're making decisions and the probability and price create a equation that ultimately drives the decision that you make um, and immediately my mind jumps to air quotes meaning that uh, you lost a hand um, or somebody bluffed you or, or whatever happened but it still fit within the framework that you had that you made a sound decision like, like what is that um, kind of control mechanism that you use in order to make sure that you don't kind of lose faith in, in your decision making uh, and frameworks that you use? Uh, that's a fantastic analogy. Yeah, 
there's no good or bad investments without price included. So something could be very cheap and be a bad investment, and something could be very expensive and be a good inv- be a good exp- investment. Um, it all, it's all about underlying value. And there's a lot of people who go through life saying, is this a buy or sell, and don't actually look at the price. And so in a poker sense, it's very, very important to be process-oriented rather than results-oriented, because results in poker and in the markets are extremely noisy, and we can make good decisions and have bad results, and vice versa. And so, as you said, we still want to be taking new information into account, and so this is where that concept that I introduced earlier of range comes into play, is that I have an expectation that this player, based on the actions they have taken, has one of these hands. There's a composition of this range. It's X percentage um, value hands, X percentage bluffs. And the only information that is useful for me is information that disproves this range and that it falls outside of this range. They show up with a hand for um, as a bluff that I didn't think they could have, or they bet a hand for value that I didn't think they could bet for value. And that means, well, my assumptions were wrong here. And that's when I adjust. I think the key to improvement in anything in this world is tightness of your feedback loops. Mm -hmm. That you make a decision and ideally you get immediate feedback. How does this change the assumptions that you use to make this decision? Um, And so that's how I'm reorienting myself is I was bluffed, but they had a hand that I thought they could bluff me with. That doesn't tell me anything. But, oh, I didn't expect that. And I want to have this part of my brain light up and say, that's fantastic. I have just learned. This is very useful. So even if I'm wrong, not making the same mistake twice, right? I've already paid tuition. Now I need to make the right adjustment. Got it. And so in poker, um, you know, I'm just thinking out loud here. So you've got, let's call it six people sitting at a table. Each person can provide a certain number of variables to your decision making, right? You, you describe some of them around the chat, the speed of clicking, uh, the bet size, uh, the position at the table, you know, all these different things. And so, you know, I, I don't know, let's say there's 10 variables at each player times the, the six players at the table. That's a... <laughs> Add a couple orders of magnitude. <laughs> uh, okay, I- explain. So you, you mentioned the, the visible examples, um, but there, there's many examples that are very invisible. Okay, um, like what? Um, Hyper situational things. Um, so I would introduce the concept of centrality here, which has an analogy to Buffett's circle of competence, that players have sit- certain situations that they're most comfortable in where they, they, they've solved it, they know they have a good strategy that works, and this becomes a crutch for them, and that they continually try to stay within this circle of competence. And so if you can shift the field of play, think about maybe a basketball game where teams prefer to slow it down versus run on the break, um, and you take them out of their comfort zone, you put them into situations that are central for you, but not central for them, meaning that you have more experience and insight into the situation than they do. You've studied it more. And when people get uncomfortable, they make bad decisions. And that's a lot of poker playing, is forcing people into making bad decisions. Um, And so that's where a lot of the variables come into play. It's essentially combinations of these variables and how do players play in very specific situations. Got it. How do you think this overlays with the financial markets, right? Like, like there's very obvious um, kind of co- uh, comparisons, right? If you think of just there's a uh, potential prize, um, and I have to make a number of decisions that go into what price am I paying, kind of what's my downside risk, what's my upside uh, potential profit. Um, there's other players in the market, etc. But how do you, coming from such a high level in the poker world, think about the uh, crossover to the finance world? I mean, we could do a whole episode on that. Um, I'll, I'll give a couple highlights that you know maybe we can dive into for today. Um, So one that I always love to talk about is people always forget that there's someone on the other side of the trade. And so when you're playing poker, the most important thing is who else is at the table. So you can be a little league player, but if you're at a t-ball league, you're the MVP. 
um, and a lot of being one of the best poker players, which my definition is who's winning the most because why else are you playing? Everyone's, you know, who's who's the most skilled? Like, well, you know, all that matters is your bank account at the end of the day. That's why you're playing poker. And the best poker players in the sense are the ones who are playing in the best games because it's relativistic skill. And so, I mean, that gets into a whole nother rabbit hole around, you know, online where, you know, you're taking the games that are there and trying to get into them versus live where, you know, the big, it's much more soft skills in cultivating relationships and getting into games where, you know, you might not be good, but the players are worse. Um, putting that aside for a second, thinking about who is on the other side of the trade and understanding them deeply. What are their motivations? So at the poker table, a lot of people think they're playing to make money, but they're usually playing for some other purpose. They're playing for diversion. They want to gamble. They want to test their skills. And if you can figure out what their internal driver is, their id, you can you can predict their decision making in some interesting situations. And the same thing in trades, knowing what people's risk threshold is, what their targets are, what information might they have that you don't, what is driving their decision making, are they motivated? If everyone's motivated, but what are they motivated by? All of these factors where you need to understand the other player, the other the person on your side of the trade, you understand their position, their mental state better than they understand their own. Can you change it? in the financial markets like in poker you definitely can right because you're literally sitting at a table staring at them or you're playing with them online in the financial markets if i'm buying and selling stocks or doing other things can i can i have an impact or do you think that's more market dynamics and less kind of 1v1 if you will I mean, that's probably above my, my pay grade as a retail investor. I'm imagining there's people who are listening to this who are doing things, you know, relationship-based over the phone where they know their counterparty um, personally mm -hmm. in some cases. And I assume that there's a lot more of those dynamics at play, but I wouldn't be able to speak to them. Yeah, I, th I think it's fair. Um, okay, and, and then in the financial markets, uh, one of the things I think is really timely right now is this idea of emotional control, right, and kind of risk management. Um, you talked earlier about kind of cutting your losses, right? So you sit down uh, to play poker, and you don't know if you're going to play for 16 hours or 15 minutes. Um, and at some point you make the decision today's not my day and you get up and you walk away uh having the ability to do that and kind of the maturity and the emotional um stability to do that i think is uh, obviously a really important skill because it essentially prevents losses right um and as you said kind of your 10 best days make up the majority of uh the returns for the year how does that play out in the financial markets, especially on days like today where we're watching, you know, literally the stock market opened and it's down 7% and within the first 10 minutes they halt trading. So it's obvious that there's incredible emotion and fear and greed and kind of all of these things that at, uh, um, kind of coming together in this cocktail of uh, all the things that make humans humans, but also all the things that make humans really bad sometimes at investing. You've spent your entire career trying to avoid or, or sidestep that stuff. How do you think about it? I mean, this one is is so timely and is so in line with what I'm thinking right now. Um, a post I'm releasing this week is is all about this. It's called The Perils of Over-Optimization. A, a perils? The perils oh, of over-optimization, okay. as in optimization being a trap. In let's say peace times, we're always trying to perfect things, our systems, mm -hmm. our routines, our tools. And, you know, when we're in war times, you know, sorry for the bad analogy, uh, all those things go out the window. I mean, who cares what our task manager is? Like, who cares, you know, if our emails are well formatted? Um, oh, well, I, I don't need to do my full routine today. Like, everything goes out the window. And that's a problem because you need to practice like every day is game day. Mm -hmm. And you don't know when you wake up what the day is going to be like. And if you're completely unprepared for it, you're in a position to make very poor decisions. And so you have to wake up ready for anything and you know, hopefully you're pleasantly surprised and say, well, okay, I can go back to you know, doing the things that I would normally do. Or you're ready for, hey, this is what we were waiting for. Now is the time to take the space of action. But that happens through preparation. And the antidote to this over-optimization is showing up and being consistent. 
and those are the best systems and the best tools and structures for your day is that you show up every day that if today is game day, you are ready to play. Mm -hmm. Elaborate on that a little bit, right? Because I think that it's uh, very uh, obvious when you talk about it from a poker standpoint of like, I'm making the choice to sit down and I'm going to play. And it, if it's my day, I'm going to play for 16 hours. If not, then it'll be a short period of time. And a lot of the things that you described, I think, were um, very uh, concrete in the sense of you're clearing your mind. You're getting kind of that emotional um, balance, right? And, and then you start to play. And it's all centered around making sound decisions or that framework or focus on process. In the investing world, it's a little bit different. Now, if you're a day trader, right, then I, I think that um, it has a very similar uh, kind of mechanism to uh, poker, right? Because you're making a lot of smaller decisions, uh, going through that framework over and over and over again throughout a single day. But if you're not trading in the sense of uh, kind of multiple trades per day, if you're making more longer term decisions, how do you think about applying that framework or that plan to that when it's not let's make a decision every day sometimes actually it's we are going to resist making decisions and, and instead what we're going to do is we're going to not participate right we're, we're going to basically wait months and months and months or years and not do anything but still come to work every day kind of ready for game day if you will absolutely so i think there's two dimensions of this the first is having principles or rules in place that you look at past experience and with, with the benefit of hindsight and how you made decisions, continually keeping track of that, having what, what rules, what structures could we have be, had in place at the time in order to have made better decisions and putting those things in place and trusting them when the situation comes up. And so I'm very principle driven is that I want to eliminate as many trivial decisions as I can to essentially outsource these to principles so that an algorithm could follow it, i.e. Bridgewater. And if I have seen that this strategy performs well over time, that if I do this every day, I do well. If I do this first, I do well. If I, if I check these things before making a decision, I do well. I put that principle in place and I follow it in good times and in bad. And so that raises the floor, limits the downside, but also causes us not to miss things. I think on the other side, being maybe a little bit more tactical, if I can talk about a couple things I've done with some of my portfolio manager clients, uh, it comes to structuring the day in that the most important things are moving forward. You're being intentional with what you do, especially how you start the day before you let the flood, the stream of market information flood you. Mm -hmm. And so something that I always talk about, if the market is opening up at nine, like your day doesn't start at nine, your day starts at six, six to seven, you have a morning routine that allows you to perform at peak. And then you have you know seven to eight, you take care of anything that you need to do so that you can have your mind on the day. It's like, so that you, when you're at the office, you could be at the office for the open. And then I think from eight to nine is you've pre-selected one hour, I call this the power hour. What is your most important thing in other terms? like? What are you going to do? Is this you have a company that you want to do a deep dive on? Is it you're writing a memo that's going to you know, promote your position to help you get some deal flow? It's like there's something that is holding you back from you know, growing your portfolio, growing your investment base. What, if my perspective is if you prepared yourself, you, you've planned out what you want to do from that hour, and for that one hour, that is all you do, you single task. The rest of the day is a complete bonus. Mm -hmm. Market bell hits. You can be completely reactive as much as you want. Generally, going from proactive is, to reactive is a one-way street. The second you check your phone, the second you check your email, the second you check, you know, the the tickers, you're not going back to doing deep dive research. And that's why it's a critical that you get it out of the way so that you're starting the day from a good place that you're already moving forward. And then you can be opportunistic with no regrets. You know, you have full attention. You're very in tune with the dynamics of what's happening because you've cleared your mind. You've made progress. Um, I think that that simple structure, thinking about how you start to the day in order to set yourself up well, it extends to investing, it extends to you know, founders of, of companies, and it's just a matter of knowing what are the important activities that are moving your business forward, and what are your bottlenecks, what is most holding you back, what can you do to attack that? I'm a huge believer in this. I mean, every morning I wake up and the first thing that I do is I write, right? And, and it's a way for me to basically organize my thoughts, et cetera, and, and I 
and probably one of the rare ones that I send it to people, but uh, there's plenty of people who write in a journal or do whatever. This is what I call uh, a forcing function, that if you've externalized your goals, there are others involved, even if even if you think they might be reading it, um, that causes us to show up um, as a classic study. If you have a loose, um, loose idea, hey, I'd like to go to the gym tomorrow, on average, your chances are 10%. And you can continually raise that percentage as you add more forcing functions into place. Or if you get to the point where, hey, I'm meeting this specific person at this specific time at the gym, and we're going to do this workout, you go from 10% to 95% because you're going to show up. Yeah. It, it's crazy how science works, right? <laughs> like, like we a lot of people know this stuff, but they just don't take the time to actually put it in place to increase the probability There's, of them doing Everyone's it. trying to reinvent the wheel, you know, looking for new diets, all these, like, last-mile nootropic solutions. Like, the right ways of doing things haven't really changed much in four decades. They're just not evenly distributed. Yeah. The planning part, I think most people say that makes a ton of sense, right? Put together your plan, clear your head, be ready for whatever comes to you that day. Uh, what comes to you that day, though, can drastically uh, throw people off. And so it's kind of the, the Mike Tyson, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Uh, today is a great day to have a conversation about getting punched in the face. Last night, oil dropped you know, 30%. There was uh, multiple circuit breakers that have gotten uh, hit both in the futures market and the stock market. Um, we have seen uh, the interest rate of, uh, or the treasury yield drop to 0.5%, right? I think all of the treasuries now are below 1% uh, for the first time in history. <laughs> Just like, this is like we're in a heavyweight battle. There's been a lot of first in histories recently. Yeah, yeah, and and it's just the reason why I go to the heavyweight battles is because it's not like people got punched once in the face. They've gotten punched over and over and over again, right? Um, it's kind of like the Marshawn Lynch. He's like, my job is to run them over and over and over and over again. Wear them down. That's what's happening in the financial markets right now. All of those people with plans, all of a sudden, aren't so confident in those plans. If you were talking to them or advising them, etc., like, what do you? put them through? How do you have that conversation and keep them kind of as on task and on target as possible, given that they're getting those punches in the face kind of continuously uh, over the last couple of days? So maybe I can propose a, a framework, um, maybe a visual interface uh, where we're talking about managing one's emotional state in the face of quickly changing circumstances. Um, and so I would have you man it. Let's say you visualize a continuum in front of you. So, you know, an arrow going from your left hand to your right hand. And one that we could do would be you have your parasympathetic nervous system and you have your sympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic, essentially fight or flight, heart, heart rate pounding out of your out of your chest. Like you could, you could outrun a bear at this moment. You are fully engaged. That is the full, you know, far right of the spectrum. And then you have parasympathetic nervous system, you know, far left, like you've been meditating in a cave for the last 10 years and you've just emerged, you have reached nirvana. Like you are, you are oneness. And thinking about where are you on this continuum at this very moment? That is, that is the first step, is awareness. If you can bring awareness, think about in terms of a measurement, you're making something that is subjective, a little bit more objective, you can make better decisions. And the meta skill here, the next level of this is where on this spectrum is it best for you to be right now? Sometimes it makes sense to be full fight or flight. Sometimes it makes sense for you to be full guru. Usually it's somewhere in the middle, but there's a great deal of nuance in there. Um, another one that I would propose, and you know, maybe we could talk about making this into another two by two, would be you have fully confident on one side. You 100% know the right move. You're a maximalist. You're all in. You're leveraged if necessary. Um, no news that could come out would ever change your mind. You're, you have 100% priors. You are, you are certain in black edge terms. You have the far left, which is hypercritical. Every new piece of information that comes out flips your flips your mind. You are you are you know on the razor's edge, a straw breaking the camel's back. You are extremely critical of your own thinking processes. What have I been missing this whole time? How have I gotten myself into this? You are maximally critical. And at the same time, it's like recognizing where are you on this spectrum. Some of you t listening today might be fully critical. You're thinking about, man, I should have acted sooner. Why didn't I see this coming? What do I do now? Uh, you know, everything is getting out of control. 
maybe today is the day where you can recognize I need to shift more into confidence. Like, this hasn't happened before, but similar things have happened before. Generally, best decisions are made by looking at base rates, by taking the outside view. Like, what pers previous experience do you have to shed some light on this situation? Who can you talk to? What, how, when you've made decisions in the past, when they've gone well, what have you done? When they've gone well, how have they gone poorly? And can you do a pre-mortem in that to prevent yourself from making a bad decision today? Think about if I made a terrible decision today, you know, if I overreacted, if I made the wrong move, how did I fail and not doing that? Yeah, and, and I think this um, idea of measuring failure is really important because uh, one of the things that I see this play out all the time in uh, investing is really around if I sell today. Right, and, and the way that I always think about it is, um, it, it, baby boomers are a great example. So I had this tweet storm over the weekend where I basically said, uh, baby boomers basically started saving when they should have been investing over the last decade and have just started to invest when they should have been saving. So the whole idea is, Baby boomers had two core assumptions. One was that the financial system was bulletproof in the United States, and two was that their greatest asset was their home. The financial crisis obviously shook that to the core, and so all of a sudden, what happens is between 2007 and 2009, you see baby boomers get incredibly um, uh, unconfident in their decision making, they get unconfident in the financial system, and they start to break down. And so what they did was rather than uh, start investing at what became the longest bull market in history, they actually uh, became very um, kind of close chested, right? And they started to save money rather than invest it. So as they're saving the money, stock market explodes, right? They're not exposed to that upside. Well, over time they realize, hey, maybe I shouldn't be saving, I should be investing. This thing has been running like crazy. 2015, 16, 17, and 18, 19, they start saying, maybe I should be investing a little bit more. And so what do they do? They start to get a little bit of exposure, then more, then more, then more. And they start to realize, oh shit, I'm behind my financial goals. And they break down that decision-making process and then become so overexposed because they are um, more aggressive in their risk appetite to get yield um, and to get returns that now as the market turns over, basically right at the moment when they are you know, no governor on this, 100% exposure to markets, et cetera, or, 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 you know, incredibly high exposure to markets, bam, it turns over and it's going to crush them a second time. And to me, like, although that plays out over a 12-year period, give or take, you know, 13-year period, that is the essence of really bad decision making. And it shows a perfect example of how human emotion can take what are generally intelligent people and completely flip it on their head, and they do things out of comfort ra rather than out of uh, sound decision making. And it seems like that's what you've spent most of your life trying to combat and make sure that you yourself don't make those decisions. Wow, that that was a total value bomb. I hope you guys are paying attention there. I know I was. Uh, in in a quick word, yes, I that's what I think about. Uh, I think everything really comes down to making good decisions and everything essentially is a bet. You know, there's some risk to crossing the street, but I make that bet every day because <laughs> I need to get to the other side. And it's very important to closely examine the way that you make decisions and to have these principles in place to understand your own situation well enough and to step outside of it well enough. And so that if circumstances change, you can act appropriately, not overreact, not underreact, that you have conviction because you've done the hard work ahead of time that you know this just becomes a litmus test, essentially, um, but that you know how you're going to make bad decisions and you prevent that in advance. How do you think about measuring downside risk and understanding when to kind of cut your losses and, and walk away or uh, kind of shut down for the day versus uh, continuing to experience losses or pain? Like what's the framework that you use there? Well, I, I, th I think this one's probably best illustrated by an example. So a, we were talking about how a key advantage in poker is, we were talking about comfort a little bit, is getting another player out of their comfort zone. And so I was playing in a game the other night. Um, the game's live uh, online. They, they live streamed it. I'm a little bit embarrassed by it. By, by To be honest, I think some of my decision making could have been better. Um, but it's been it was a very valuable experience you know to watch yourself making decisions uh it's, it's a very quick way to improve I, I hadn't done that before and 
the dynamic of this game changed very drastically. And so I had showed up for what was supposed to be a 510 no limit game. And so typically a no limit game you buy in for $1000 and in these games they play a little bit bigger so I was expecting to buy in for 3 or $4000. And you know just to cover my downside so that I could play well, I brought $13000. Right? So like, this is well, if things go really badly, I could lose 13000, but my my downside is capped. Like I can only lose what I brought. Um I show up and I realize that there there's some new faces in the room that I hadn't seen before and a acquaintance and now, you know, trusted friend after he gives me this tip is like, "Hey, you see that guy? There's like five players at the table I recognize as one guy I didn't recognize, kind of kind of slobby, kind of, you know, he had a giant thing of vodka in his hand. I'm like, "Wow, this guy is the target." And uh, he says, "Hey, like that's the best player in the city. Like, watch out." And I keep an eye on him. I'm like, oh wow, that's that's really interesting. And this guy goes on. There's ten, you know, ten players at the table, and in a ten ten handed game, you'd probably want to be playing, depending on how good your cards are, between ten and twenty percent of hands. It's just like there's a lot of players at the table, and it's just not profitable to play many hands. This guy is playing fifty percent of hands, so half of all hands he is playing, and it's just impossible to play profitably in this point. And he continues to consume alcohol and you know make some some pretty questionable decisions, like s- clearly some thought behind it but taking on way too much risk and because he's losing and you know wants to try to get back to this even right this this is a, a theme that occurs a lot in investment as we think about you know we're down how can I get back to where I was before he keeps trying to raise the stakes and so what once was a 510 game because a 5 10 20 40 80 160 320 game where now we are playing for 30 times the stakes that I had shown up for. Um, and some hands, you know, these are some amongst the biggest games I've ever played. And I clearly am undercapitalized for this game. I didn't bring enough. And so I'm trying to think of my own strategy is, well, should I put all my money on the game? Into, because there's clearly a really big opportunity here. But if I get unlucky and I bust, then, you know, I have to go home. And, you know, I've, I've you know, blown my load. I have like, I, I have all my chips on the table. And so, you know, trying to play that dynamic strategy when these are dynamics that are so different. And what was very apparent to me, these are very, very skilled live players who are used to playing in very dynamic environments and very large games. And it has shifted from a situation from was completely in my comfort zone and very underneath my control where I know the exact strategy to is like, I don't really know what the exact strategy is in this game. And these guys have made it more central. Like they understand these dynamics better. They're clearly playing really bad, badly fundamentally, but they're just going to be in su- in situations that they know well and I don't know at all. Mm-hmm. And so it reached it reached a point where it said, well, even though on paper I know I have a large edge in this game, today I don't think I have a large edge. And so at a certain point, after about six hours, I said, hey guys, it's been it's been fun. You know, the stream had ended at that point. I said, I'm I'm gonna go home and uh, you know sleep it off. Um, and you know, normally in a lot of these situations, I would have been up until 6 a.m. playing with these guys because th- this is, you know, this is like a once a month, you know, once a year potentially type game. You know, these these guys could you know win and lose six figures in a night. Um, but I said, hey, given these this, these dynamics, I don't think they're favorable to me, and I'm going to make the the smart decision and step away. And so I think maybe giving that example illustrates you know some of the things mm-hmm. that I would think about. And, and part of it, I guess, is really uh, understanding that even though you might be the better player at that table, right, and, and maybe that's accurate or, or close to accurate, being the best player doesn't always mean that you're going to go home winning. And so it's understanding not only the skill set of you and all the other players at the table, but also the environment and your comfort level and kind of m- multiple variables there just not lining up. And so you decided to walk away. Exactly. And, and that's that's really why keeping identity small is very important. And, you know, I've had issue and everyone has issues of thinking, you know, I'm the best. And, you know, my results show that I, on average, I am probably amongst the best, if not the best players. And actually, I would I would assume that some of these players have won quite a bit more than me, but just in games that I don't know about. And it, it required a humbleness of saying that, hey, in my environment, you know, particularly online you know, six mass cash games or a typical five ten game where I have a lot of experience, 
I would play against any of these guys any day of the week for as long as they would sit down with me. But today, given these dynamics, I am not the best player at the table. In fact, I might not be amongst the best players at this table. And so recognizing that and, you know, adjusting my perception say, hey, that's okay, that's fine. And, you know, I win because I play the games where I'm amongst the best. So I, I tweeted this quote earlier today, um, and uh, I actually f- didn't have anything to do with you coming in here, but but now it makes a lot of sense, uh, which is basically, you know, one of the big rules of risk management is to make sure that you never blow yourself up. You always ha- you, you don't ever get to a situation where uh, you can't live to fight another day. And essentially that's what you're talking about here was even though um, there is potential high payoff, the I'm going to go home without any money is not a good – kind of risk reward trade off. And so walking away ends up being the right decision to make. Right. Um, tell me about this. Uh, so you've got a workbook. Uh, it is called experiment without limits, personal experiments for peak performance and productivity. Uh, you've got this life outside of poker, but you take a lot of the things <laughs> that or you not. do uh, with poker and you uh, spend time with uh, portfolio managers at financial firms, uh, founders, uh, executives, etc. Tell us a little bit about that uh, work and then kind of how this workbook came together. Well, sure. So, I mean, in the poker world, I coached hundreds of poker players who were already amongst the world, and I took them from, you know, top 2% to top 0.01%. And I realized that many of the skills that were instrumental to becoming one of the world's best poker players were highly transferable to other fields as well. So fast growing companies to executives who are, you know, high up in a large corporation to especially I love working with portfolio managers and other active investors. So, you know, real estate, uh, crypto, that type of thing. And I found that having these frameworks for decision making and essentially what I call peak performance and that you are showing your best self is showing up every day so that you are in the best position in order to make good decisions and just generally succeed, um, that I was able to take a lot of the things that I had developed in my, in my journey from going from being a pretty good poker player to one of the best, teaching this to other poker players, and now taking some of those frameworks and teaching them to others who they can apply in their day-to-day job and day-to-day decision-making. And so Experiment Without Limits was my attempt to distill down everything that I've learned in the past decade. So millions of hands of poker playing, four years of working with high-performing executives into what are the few things that work reliably in order to perform. And so, you know, there's building block chapters as far as how do you set goals, how do you build systems, how do you develop habits and routines. And then I get hyper tactical around how do you optimize your time, how do you optimize your focus, how do you optimize your energy levels, how do you accelerate your learning, how do you eliminate procrastination, how do you optimize your mental game. Um, these are, there are principles in there that are distilled down, and then I break them into what I call experiments where you can follow this step by step and implement this into your life and see the results for yourself. And yeah, I give it away for free. Um, It's available for download on my website at uh, theforcingfunction.com slash workbook. I think we'll probably put a a link in the show notes. And yeah, if if what I've been talking about today is of interest, you know, highly recommend you check it out. Can you tell us a story about somebody that you've put through the program and kind of like has wild results? Because it it's one of these weird things where I think when people hear like, oh, you shouldn't procrastinate, right? Or, oh, you should like focus and you should prepare. Like, it sounds stupid, but then when people actually go through something like this, they're like, holy shit, my life can change, right? The results of what I am doing can change. So maybe can you tell us a story um, of what, kind of what you've seen and, and impact it can have? Sure, so right now I think about taking people who are already performing in a very high level, let's say they're in the top 5%, and how do I get them into the top 1%? This is not a zero to 60 type thing. These are already people who are having amazing results and want to improve even more. And I'll give give maybe an example is, on the outside, it looks like this person has everything 
put together, right? I don't want to get too specific about clients just to, to protect mm -hmm. their anonymity, but they have everything put together. No one would ever guess that they think of themselves as a procrastinator, that they don't really stick to their routines, that they wake up and just kind of do whatever they feel like or don't really have a good plan, that they're constantly getting distracted by Twitter or on their phone. And at the end of the day, they just don't feel like they're very effective. Like from the outside, it looks like everything is going well and they're getting the things they need to do done, but they're not moving the right things forward. They're not doing the right work. Um, their time is not really a reflection of their priorities. Um, and you know, some of those priorities are being neglected completely, whether it's their health, whether it's their family, whether it's their relationships, and in some points, their business. And so I think about what are the habits and systems that this person needs to put in place in order to make sure that they're moving forward in all these right ways. And once we start collecting data together, what's working, what's not working, we can identify ways to double down and accelerate that progress. Yeah, how, how much of it is doubling down on kind of what they're good at and ignoring the things they're bad at versus trying to cut out the things they're bad cut at? Cut your losses early, double down on your winners. Really, and, and so it's if you know that, hey, I procrastinate a lot, but when I'm hyper-focused, I'm incredibly uh, effective at what I do, do you basically then say, look, forget about the procrastination component. Let's figure out how do we get you in that hyper-productive state and just double and triple down on that? 100%. So focus means being focused. And so pick one thing and focus on it. And I will compress this down to a book title, which is The Goal. And this talks about the theory of constraints or the notion of bottlenecks, that everything is a linear process. And along this process, there is one point that is most holding up going from input to output. And so you said, maybe for this person, it's procrastination. Maybe it's they're not planning. Maybe it's that they don't have good eating habits. Uh, maybe they're not getting the right level of sleep. Maybe they have too many distractions. Their work environment is not supportive, right? I try to be a detective and suss this out of them because what people think is the problem is never the problem. And try to uncover what is the bottleneck? What is most holding back progress? And the really, really counterintuitive idea of the goal is that any effort spent on something that's not the bottleneck is wasted because it is not proving overall output. And so the key is first identify the bottleneck, then keep trying things until the situation improves by attacking that bottleneck. If nothing is changing, you know you don't actually have the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's fascinating when you really break down what I think are common, um, commonly understood or accepted uh, issues, right? So, you know, hey, I don't follow my routine, I don't focus, you know, all these things. But when you scientifically break it down as to why, how do we correct that and, and start having that conversation, it's pretty simple to figure out. It's just the fact that there's somebody holding you accountable and asking you the questions and, and forcing you, right? Kind of that forcing function of changing and, or improving. Simple does not mean easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> if knowing how to do it meant we were all doing it, I mean, why are we even having this conversation? You know, we're already, we're already doing everything we wanted to do. Um, clearly there is a gap there that there are things that we know we quote unquote should be doing, but we aren't consistent with doing. And that's part of my functionality, right? I call myself the forcing function because I force you to do these things in order so you can start having the results to internalize this is something that I should be doing to the point that it crystallizes into your identity, that it no longer becomes a habit that you need to keep in the air. It's just something that you do. But the first part of that process is you need to be taking action in order to have those early gains. Right. Classic newbie gains when you go into the gym, you haven't been in the gym in a year and you start working out and, oh, my God, I'm jacked. Well, you're going to hit a plateau eventually, but those newbie gains are what keep you coming back through the pain. And that is all growth is stretching. It's having that pain, creating new muscles, and you break through that plateau. Yeah, it, the gym is a great example where um, I always wonder how much of the, like, let's say a fitness trainer is – the actual exercises they're uh, asking somebody to do versus just the trainer being there so you show up, right? I think I think a I think the trainer having you show up is worth the price of admission. I work mm -hmm. with a trainer myself, and if that's all it was, that would it's be worth, worth it. it. But what I think the really 
interesting value is you outsource your decision making to them. Interesting. You don't need to have your routine. You show up and you would do what you told. And it's much easier to follow through if you don't have to think about, oh, how long do I have in between sets? Should I be doing chest mm -hmm. or back today? Mm -hmm. um, oh, am I, should I make it through the full hour, right? It's like you're outsourcing this decision making to someone and by releasing that load, you increase your performance. You actually make a lot more out of that time that you have. Mm -hmm. Do you think it at all about kind of, uh, what is it, like uh, the exhaustion from decision making throughout the day? H how do you think about that in terms of, you just talked about outsourcing decision making to somebody else for working out, but what are your thoughts on just like in general, people make too many decisions or they don't make enough decisions during the day and can you actually yeah. kind of get tired? Yeah, I mean, the research on some of this stuff that's come out in psychology is kind of a cluster duck. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the actual word, obviously. Um, this one in particular, it's it could go either way. And okay. so it's shown that some people have shown that willpower is a muscle. And so you get stronger the more that you exercise it. Other people have shown pretty convincingly decision fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that, the word I was looking for. That's the intelligent I, way to describe the question. And so you've seen, you know, classic Steve Jobs wearing the turtle. Like I kind of pulled it off a little bit today. You know, Obama wearing the same suit every day is like you try to eliminate trivial decisions because you have a limited supply and you want to save that capacity for decisions that really matter. And I subscribe to that a little bit. And I also subscribe to the over the long run. I want to do things that are hard to make those hard things easier. Um, it's it's inconclusive, and the latest findings, which you know, who lo who knows how long the Lindy on in this is, uh, is if you believe that you have unlimited willpower, you have unlimited willpower. If you believe that willpower is limited, you have limited willpower. So in some cases where the science is unclear, you choose a belief that's most helpful for you taking action. I love it. Uh, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin and crypto? <laughs> Oh, this, this is where I get into uh, speculative territory, pun intended. Um, you know, I think most people listening to this will, uh, will know more than I. Um, I will only say personally, I've had large positions in the past, and I intend to have large positions in the future, and I have no position currently. No position? Oh, interesting. Why, why no position? Um, we live in very interesting times. Um, things, things that are generally uncorrelated over long time scales can become hyper correlated on shorter time scales. Um, I am of the perspective, again, limited, many of you know more than I, that uh, crypto at the moment is performing as a risk on asset and we're in a risk off environment. Um, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin's long term process or pro I mean, prospects. potential prospects, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and I intend to be, you know, a large holder in the future, but at this moment I am not. It, it's interesting that um, you think of it uh, kind of the short term time frames and actually take the position on and off. I think a lot of people are either uh, I believe or I don't believe. It's kind of a very binary type thing and, and it's almost more religious than it is um, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, ri risk analysis, yeah. right? And uh, and so it's refreshing to hear somebody who basically says, no, actually, I can be a long term believer and a short term, uh, maybe not a non believer, but just a, a bear or a, a neutral party in the short term, uh, even though it is in contradiction to my long term belief. The biggest costs are always hidden. And so two I would mention here first is sunk cost. And the biggest sunk cost is identity. Like you said, if, if any belief becomes religious to you know go against that belief is to give up your religion. And we have a lot of case studies on how hard that is. So uh, someone is invested and so they stay invested, right? So someone is uninvested and so they stay uninvested because they have a sunk cost of identity. The other one is opportunity cost is their I have a limited amount of capital to invest. And so anything that I am invested in, this could be time, money, energy, relationships, et cetera, are resources that are coming away from everything else. You and I having this conversation right now is coming at the expense of everything else that you could be doing. Everyone else could be doing different things instead of listening, but they're here with us and that's amazing. But this opportunity cost is so pervasive because you have to think about, I am not forced to be in any position at any given time. And being in this position comes at the expense of all the other positions that I could be in. Mm -hmm. And so in life, it's waking up and every day and not saying, am I holding? It's that 
I assume that I have sold everything before and does it make sense to buy back in, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, I am never committed to any position. I continually buy back in, right? I reinvest with my relationships. I want to keep showing up. This yeah. <laughs> is the meme that Joe has pulled up here is uh, when you nice. buy the dip, but it keeps dipping, which I think is kind of your point, right? <laughs> exactly. You have to you have to update with new information, and that could that could lead you in both sides today. Um, so I think keeping in mind both of those, the sunk cost and the opportunity cost, um, you know, it's important to be rational to keep identity out of it, and if times are changing, change with them. And how much of this is an analysis of price versus price intersected with future prospect, right? Meaning that uh, is it more of a macro decision for you, risk on, risk off? Or is it risk on, risk off is one perspective, but then you overlay that with, well, is Bitcoin at 10,000 or 2,000 right now? And, And kind of these other variables that go into it. Sure. For me, it's definitely an overlay. Um, obviously, current volatility plays into that, where being able to have limit orders in is very beneficial. Um, it's it's also thinking about, you know, what am I comfortable with, and at what point am I am I making good decisions? Right, taking the taking the personal into account. Um, I, I think it's important to come in that I have a target, I have these principles that I'm u- going to use to make decisions, and evaluating on an ongoing basis, like are these conditions still correct? Yeah, I think it's a very uh, rational and, and uh, frankly, pretty even keeled way to think about it, which doesn't surprise me that that's I'm, <laughs> I'm biased, but I think it's a good way about going on <laughs> life. What uh, what's the best book that you've ever read? Oh, man, I mean, it really <laughs> book recommendations are tough because they're so personal and it really depends upon, you know, what the person is, you know, where they are in their life right now. What What's the message that they need? Completely Some agree. of the best books that I've ever read um, aren't objectively the best, but they have the message that I needed to hear. I think people think about reading as a way to accumulate knowledge when really it's a way of priming thought. So, you know, what do you want to be thinking about right now? Um, I mentioned the goal earlier, I think, for anyone who is looking to improve their processes, which I believe should be anyone. That's a very good place to start. Um, I read uh, House of Morgan very earlier this year. I think he's a Chernow is a fantastic writer. Anything he's put out, and if you want to understand, you know, the history of the financial system, you know, generally seeing where we've been, all of this has happened before in some some sense. You can have a better understanding of what's happening in the present because we're a little bit too close to it in a sense. Having a little bit more, pers- you know, time perspective can be useful for evaluating the present. Um, as far as best book that I have read all time, um, you know the book that I reread every year probably qualifies. Uh, it's called it's a, one of those old school self help classic that's been in and out of print for fifty years. It's called The Magic of Thinking Big. The and Magic of Thinking Big. The Magic okay. of Thinking Big, and you know it kind of has some of that Dale Carnegie feel, where it's a little bit folksy, a little bit dated, but the message is so so important, and for me where I'm trying to think about bets and particularly bet sizing. Um, It's a very good frame for thinking about, I want to place fewer bets, but I want to place much larger bets. How can I think bigger? Um, This has kind of been outblown in terms of the 10x mindset, but it comes into play a lot with bottlenecks. Rather than trying to do a bunch of things, I want to put a lot of effort into the thing that's going to have the maximal outsized impact. Yeah, I love that. I'm a huge believer in uh, the mindset of going larger, thinking bigger, et cetera, um, and how people generally, uh, they, they just avoid it because it's scary, right? The the idea that by going larger, you can actually um, benefit, but you might even be able to keep the same downside risk is, uh, is usually lost. Uh, what about aliens? Believer, non-believer? Agnostic. Um, oh, come on. <laughs> Agnostic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one more, I'll, I'll I'll add to the add to the list. That's very very topical and timely. It's been a, been quite a you know trippy experience. We were talking about uh, you know understanding the historical in order to have a better perspective on the present. Um, the book is called The Hot Zone by Richard Preston, and this is about the Ebola outbreak in the oh, 80s. Interesting. Um, some interesting parallels there that you can you can see in terms of headlines and otherwise. And so reading that in parallel today um, has been very very interesting experience. Really recommend that one if you're looking for what do I pick up today? You know, while you're hopefully not sitting on a plane, maybe sitting on a beach. Um, 
back to aliens. So, you know, we're, we're getting into books now. Um, you know, one of the biggest red pill moments for me last year was reading the Three Body Problem trilogy. Um, it's been coming up a lot in the hacker communities, and I ignored it, ignored it. It's like the writing is not amazing. It's like stick with it, stick with it. And the ideas are so good, and the perspective is so big, and it goes through you know, many dimensions and billions of years and, you know, always out to the further reaches of the of the galaxy. But it's not a space opera. It's a metaphor for communism versus capitalism. And the layers go so, so deep. And part of it is the perspective that, you know, aliens are other forms of life forms that just took a slightly different uh, branch on the evolutionary tree. And due to different outside constraints, um, turned out very differently, you know, that we breathe oxygen, that we have skin or are made of meat. All these things that we completely take for granted are just a function of the constraints of the primordial soup that we were formed in. And so for me, it's very clear that there are other beings who we might even construe as gods. You think about typical, you know, flatland, a fourth dimensional creature coming through the third dimensional is, is kind of analogous to if you had a sphere going through a page where it just looks like a expanding and a decreasing circle where something like that would be so beyond our comprehension, we wouldn't even know how to explain it. Um, that there are clearly many physical dimensions out there and that the universe is a very, very big place. Um, you think Fermi types, type calculations, um, it's very possible and even probable that there is some form of life form out there that we construe as alien that exists. And I think as you know, augmentation, genetic, um, and otherwise becomes a thing, um, that will become a very interesting conversation in the coming decades as far as what is the definition of human. And we might have aliens amongst us who started human. That might be one of the best answers I've heard. <laughs> Good, I should write it down. <laughs> it, 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 it is, uh, it's a great way to look at question the definition of alien, question the definition of us, right, and also um, how those two things relate over time. I mean, I mean that just opens up the whole rabbit hole of language and fussy, fuzzy definitions where we're trying to communicate right now, and I'm using words, and hopefully we're pointing to the same thing. But that many times language is a limiter of thought, and by trying to put a label on something, we put blinders on. What one question do you have for me to finish up? I would love to know what new information would come into place where you no longer believed that Bitcoin was the future? Uh, there's a lot of things that could happen. Um, so one of the things, the reason why I love the religious uh, angle of the conversation is I think a lot of people perceive me to be religious about it, um, but I'm actually, I, I think, uh, very non-religious about it. Things that could change uh, are actually like pretty obvious. Stuff. Like if there was a bug introduced from a technical standpoint, that would drastically change the way I thought about it. If the code did not execute what it was supposed to, so kind of related to a bug, right? In terms of like the having just didn't happen or for some reason, um, that would make me question a lot of things. Uh, if there was external forces that acted on it uh, in some way. So let's say, for example, um, there was a coordinated global effort by nation states to ban ownership or something, right? I, I think that would make me question it. Um, if there was uh, something that was created in which the market started to determine was more valuable than it, at some point I would change my mind, et cetera. So I don't think that it's so much um, the like what is the one thing that would change? Because there's actually a whole bunch of things that could happen that could get me to change. To me, it's actually what is the probability of any of that happening? Uh, and I don't think that there's the same probability of it all happening. Like it's actually um, kind of a, a descending probability to some degree. And what I normally describe is uh, if you go to a spectrum of things, like the most technical things on the left and the most non-technical things on the right, I'm much more worried about the technical things than I am about the non-technical things. But the technical things aren't like the things you hear people on Twitter yelling and screaming about of like, oh, it, it's, you know, uh, the block times or the, the speed or like all that kind of stuff. It's not performance related. It's all about the actual structure and the ability to prevent 
errors, right? So when somebody asks me, like, what do I think is the number one most likely thing to occur that will ruin Bitcoin? It's what I call like the self-inflicted wound. It's some kind of code gets committed that ends up actually having a bug in it, and that code ends up ruining the whole thing. And so the like the the reason why I believe that is what is the thing that can act on Bitcoin that is most likely to have an effect? Uh, it's humans changing it in any form at all. Uh, I'm much more worried about that than I am like you know what a central bank does or whatever else. And so I think that's in the grand scheme of things like a pretty small concern because the process is pretty well determined that's you know we got 11 years of kind of seeing how it plays out and and uh, they're pretty slow methodical intentional etc um but i don't think a lot of people worry about that stuff right when i talk to people they're usually worried about like all the other stuff like oh what is going to happen if you know x or y or z happens thus is being overlooked yeah and and to well and to me it's like uh i, I one time gave the example to somebody the things I worry about Bitcoin are the things that are closest to Bitcoin, right? It, it's almost like um, if you think of a, uh, a fort in medieval times, right? Very, very rarely was it some invading force just came and killed everybody, right? It was usually things like uh, we accidentally poisoned ourselves or uh, there was somebody inside who like, you know, uh, was mad at the king, so he killed the king, right? Or um, they allowed somebody to get into the fort because their brother was from another town or... Human error. Yeah, like all that kind of stuff. And so I think the same thing here. Um, Hopefully we've got all the fail safes in place. You know, I obviously have very high uh, conviction given the data we have today, but look, it can change, right? And so uh, I don't don't know. We'll we'll see what happens, but um, it's one of those things also where like at some point you're just like, Look, this is what I believe, right? If it changes, I'll let everyone know. But, like, reminding everybody every day that this is what I believe, people are just like, if you stop telling them, they're like, wait, do you not believe that anymore? And you're like, no, 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 I'll let you know if I change my mind. Um, but but not, uh, not yet. That's really fascinating. And it touches on this interesting idea of being able to change your mind and not getting entrenched in your current position, that if circumstances change and knowing what those circumstances are, that you're ready to change, classically called, you know, strong beliefs, weakly held, where there are some people who do change their mind, but because they have this identity that's been built around this position, you know, they become full hedgehog, you know, how do you switch from a fox and, you know, not make those who are following you for this very specific opinion that validates all their own beliefs upset. It's it's a challenging thing in this world that's hyper-connected driven by social media, et cetera. And I think it'll be a, a continually interesting one. And those are changes of beliefs that I am particularly sensitive to and weigh very highly is if someone has been pounding the table for a decade with a certain position and all of a sudden they reverse, that's a really big signal to me. Yeah, it, it's um you see this in politics all the time, right? Which is basically like, well, they um, don't actually hold positions. Well, well he, here's here's the two examples. So I'll, I'll go both sides of the aisle because we have examples right now of, of each. Um, Mike Bloomberg was a Republican his entire <laughs> life and ran as a Democrat. Uh, Donald Trump was a Democrat his entire life and ran as a Republican. Yeah. And political parties don't actually exist. It, exactly, and and so you almost get into this thing of like the quote unquote identity almost is my identity only matters it, because it's a self-serving identity more so than it is actually what I believe. And I think that being able to separate when is identity like truly identity, like I actually believe this stuff, I, I'm identifying with it, etc. versus I want you to believe I'm this person because I identify this way. Um, Cognitive this- dissonance is a hell of a drug, right? If it's change my beliefs or change my behavior. Ooh, changing my behavior. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where can uh, where can people go get the workbook, uh, find you, etc.? Man, this is so much fun. I feel like we uh, should do this again sometime. So, if if what I said today resonated, you know, if I've gotten you so far, and perhaps I can get you to come along a little bit deeper, highly encourage you to uh, check out the workbook. So, my company is the Forcing Function, and that can be downloaded for free at theforcingfunction.com/workbook. Um, Some of the books and uh, articles that I mentioned today, we'll throw some links into the uh, show notes as well. Um, I think this concept of bottlenecks is really important because there's likely something that's holding you back that's invisible to you. And so in that realm, I've created a uh, free quiz that you can take that's called the performance assessment. And so that's the forcingfunction.com slash assessment. And the goal of taking that quiz is to eliminate what is most holding you back. 
Um, I can be hit up on all the major uh, social media to pick. Um, my handle is always at Sparks Marks. Go get the workbook. <laughs> <laughs> Very simple. I, I've had the chance to, to look through it. And uh, when you hear workbook, by the way, uh, some of you are going to be like, oh, what is it, like two, three pages, like a worksheet? This is like a legit book with, like, all kinds of information, uh, quotes, workspace, um, a lot of different, like, I'll, I'll call them tasks almost, um, and things that you can go through. There's, like, a daily planning uh, template, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's 100 pages, and every word in those pages has been carefully chosen here, uh, to this, keep it as short as possible. This is the page we're going to show people. There, there's literally uh, all kinds of graphs and charts, et cetera. So go, uh, go and, uh, and get this. Um, but uh, thank you so much for coming, man. This is awesome. You uh, you got a way of thinking about the world that I think more people could benefit from. So I appreciate you coming in and uh, and sharing that. And uh, hopefully people stay safe out there because the markets are not going <laughs> to be their friend for the few next few days, I don't think. <laughs>